Hello, you're listening to On Israel in Al Monitor. I'm Ben Kaspit from Tel Aviv. Israel has long branded itself as the startup nation. Once known as the people of the book, Israelis are now recognized as the people of high tech and cyber power. Technology has turned Israel from a poor nation into a prosperous world leader, from a country relying on uh, handouts into a sought after ally. Today, we will take a break from our usual discussion of politics and security. Our podcast will deal instead with a bit of history and philosophy, with the threats and challenges of the confusing world in which we live and its impact on our lives in general and on Israel in particular. Is the technological revolution equal in scale and significance to the industrial re- revolution? What are the major changes uh, it has introduced into our lives and what future does it hold for humankind and its planet? What uh, threats does it pose? How can we deal with them? And of course, what Israel as a small, flexible, adaptable and fast-moving state should do to preserve its current standing on the world stage and even improve it. Our guest today is Yonatan Adiri, who served as a CTO to the late President Shimon Peres. He was also his uh, political and diplomatic advisor, the ninth president of Israel, and is uh, considered a leading entrepreneur in healthcare technology in Israel and beyond. We'll discuss all these fascinating issues with him after a short break. I'm Elizabeth Hagedorn, and I'm the State Department Correspondent at El Monitor. And I'm Joe Snell. I'm El Monitor's video editor. Let's admit it. This past year has been difficult to stay on top of the news and sift through what's accurate and what's misleading. Let El Monitor help you. If you care about the Middle East and North Africa, you should consider listening to El Monitor's audio series on the Middle East with Andrew Parasoliti and Amber and Zaman and on Israel with Ben Caspi. You can now watch our newest video podcast, Reading the Middle East with Gilles Capel. You can subscribe to these series on your favorite podcast platforms. And through a host of free daily and weekly newsletters, we offer a range of perspectives with the highest journalistic standards. You can subscribe to these newsletters at almonitor.com. As an award-winning media service headquartered in Washington, D.C., Almonitor has a network of over 160 contributors around the world. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to visit almonitor.com, where you can find all of these newsletters and podcasts, along with first-class reporting and analysis. Now I'm happy to say hello uh, and welcome here uh, my friend and colleague uh, Yonatan Adiri. How are you doing, Yonatan? And thank you for joining us here in, uh, on Israel in Al Monitor. Good, good morning or evening to you. Hey, Ben. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Looking forward to the conversation. Okay, so let's start with an easy question. How do you define... <laughs> the era in which we live compared to the history of uh, humankind? Are we living through one uh, of history's most important uh, revolutions? Will the digital technological revolution impact our lives to the same extent as the industrial revolution, for example? Is the invention of uh, digital computing uh, equal in value and scale to that of uh, electricity, for example? Is Bill Gates as important as uh, Thomas Edison? Well, I think, you know, fundamentally, we are living in an incredible era, um, but I would not equate to the era of the late 19th uh, 19th century when Thomas Edison and others have operated. I definitely will not uh, consider the, the strength of invention that we're experiencing over the last 15 to 20 years to resemble the impact on humanity that electricity had um, or the light bulb or aviation. But I do think we are living in an exceptional and very impactful period in time in history, uh, which is fundamentally the consequence of a combination of two trends that have never um, happened at the same time. Humanity has experienced exponential growth in technology before. 
in period, different periods in history around the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, and you know, the post-Second World War era. But we haven't experienced yet, and the last decade was indeed that, is exponential growth of technology that is combined with an exponential or near exponential decline in price at the same time. Now, let me give you a couple of examples so our listeners will understand. When, when we think about something that's you know, really dear to everybody listening to our conversation today, which is bandwidth, right? How quickly and how strongly can we engage over our mobile phone? A decade ago, um, we had 3G mobile networks that ruled the earth. They allowed for about, you know, five megabytes per second bandwidth. And, and we were charged, you know, a half a dollar, a dollar, 20 cents per SMS 10 years ago. Um, five years later, 2015, 16, we were at the era of 4G, right? This five years. And here we are at 10x that capability. We're getting endless bandwidth for free. Um, from a dollar per SMS, five years later, we're doing HD video over mobile. Uh, you know, for a perspective, it used to be uh, about, um, you know, three hours to download an 800 megabyte film on 3G, um, which ended up taking less than a minute on 4G, just five years later. Today, we're getting into 5G, we're gearing up to one gigabyte, another 10x, uh, practically for free. To those listening to us abroad uh, in Israel, you pay $12 for an unlimited package in Israel. There is no Netflix, there is no TikTok, there is no Disney Plus, Snapchat, or any other thing. Uh, if bandwidth doesn't explode like that, well, at the same time, cost doesn't go to zero. A couple more quick example, examples. In 2001, it cost $100 million to decode a gene. Today, it costs less than 1000 And this is why we could decode a virus like COVID and developed a compound that turned into the FDA-grade vaccine within 42 days of its discovery. Again, that is from $100 million to decode a single gene 20 years ago to $1,000 today. And maybe the last one, which I think is an important example because you know, you've raised Bill Gates, I would say Elon Musk is not less of an important person in terms of you know, when we'll look back at the 21st century. When you think about the electric car industry, uh, we measure batteries by kilowatt hours. A kilowatt hour in a battery pack allows for six kilometers of range for the car. In 2010, Ben, that is 10 years ago, not 100 years ago, a kilowatt hour cost $1,100. That means that if you wanted to travel 450 kilometers, you would have had to pay $100,000 for that battery. That same battery today is at $140 uh, dollars per kilowatt hours. It's a one order of magnitude less. That's 90% price decrease in a decade. And you pay $10,000 for a 450 kilometers of range. So these are just a couple of examples of how crazy this era is. And I think what is unique about it is not that it's great in terms of the discovery. It's the pace of growth of tech that's almost happening in parallel to the decline in price. You, I, rem I remember, remember now a guy in Israel, I, I guess you will remember him uh, as well, named Chai Agassi. Uh, actually, he was the first sure. Elon Musk. I think 10 years ago, he tried to bring the, the electric car to Israel and he broke his, uh, his legs and filed for bankruptcy exactly because what he just described, uh, uh, the timing was poor. Right now, it's going to, uh, I think, conquer the world. And, uh, and uh, actually, time became a product, and I want to talk to you about time. Uh, from what you've uh, been saying, I gather that uh, time has essentially grown shorter. The time periods needed to do almost everything have shrunk significantly. People live at a completely different pace than they live throughout history. Everything grows or shrinks exponentially. Processes that used to make months or years can be completed within hours or days. You know, I, I look at mm -hmm. our kids. Mm -hmm. When when we were young, we, yeah. we we planned to find a decent work and you know uh, go on until uh, until uh, retirement. Now I think that eight months is the the average uh, a time a, a, a capsule that that uh, a twenty year old guy is is working in in a working place. So something very essential has been changed according to time. 
Ben, I think I think you're spot on. Um, we we it takes less time to grow a business. It takes significantly less time uh, to discover. Again, remember, 42 days from the discovery of the structure of COVID until we had a compound that went into clinical trials. And that time shortening is a radical shift in how humanity is built today. Um, just to give you an example, there is something going on as we speak today. It is happening clearly in the US and is now growing into the macroeconomics of Europe as well, which is called a great resignation, right? So many people are leaving their jobs, looking for a new job that the workplace doesn't know how to adjust. And the last, I would say, 12 to 15 years shown, um, as you, you've you know, instinctively understood, when things take shorter, um, it is also the time of the startup, right? It has never been easier to dethrone the king, right, so fast. And we've seen many kings being dethroned in the last decade, some of them in the uh, commercial space. You know, if you just think about it, you know, 12, 13 years ago, um, Apple, you know, launched its iPhone in year one, 2007. It sold about 1 million units when Nokia sold that year, 435. That's 435 times what Apple sold. Three years later, Apple was selling, you know, 40 million units. Nokia was down to 120. So within three years, Nokia went to a quarter of sales. Apple today is a two and a half trillion dollar company that is 80x Nokia. Just to give you a sense, you know, Apple launched its AirPods, you know, the white AirPods, um, I think five years ago, it is now selling $12 billion of revenue, just the AirPods. That's more than NVIDIA, one of the world's leading chip makers is selling every year and almost half of Nokia's current, you know, global revenue. So yes, everything is taking shorter. And I think humanity and the structures we built over the last 15 to 70 years, 50 to 70 uh, years, are ill-equipped. They're not aligned with this space of change. So the, the supersonic speed of events has its advantages, uh, as we've just uh, discussed. Are there also downsides? Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, this is closer to your sphere of coverage and expertise. I think the massive downside is this has also been a decade of distrust political systems and socioeconomic, you know, habits we've built over 15 to 20 years have collapsed um, and the systems are not adapting fast enough. And I think the outcome is a broad distrust in the systems that uh, we all have, have hoped um, and trusted to be there next to us when things go sour as they have in the last two years. So I think this pace of change um, has really driven political systems and big systems that we all relied on into the brink of being irrelevant. And to a great degree, the, the thing that connects a lot of the experiences we're seeing across the globe, um, I think, is this air of distrust. Um, when you're looking at something like the Bitcoin, which in effect, right, is has no value, you know, outside of the value attached to it by everybody who buys and sells it, to me, the value of Bitcoin is adjacent or is a great predictor of how much you know, distrust there is in the world towards the existing systems. So yes, I do think that there is a downside. The downside is that the systems we built for so many years uh, have failed us and there is a growing distrust. The best proxy for it is the price of Bitcoin in my view. Um, and that is something we're gonna need to grapple with. And I do hope um, we'll know how to uh, you know, jump back as societies very quickly because otherwise, you know, in previous histories, in, in previous events like that in history, um, this ended up with collapse or with violence, which I hope we're not going to see um, as those systems collapse and no new systems emerge uh, to replace them. Yes, I think I feel exactly what you uh, just described. Uh, nothing is, uh, you cannot trust anything or anybody anymore. Life is not uh, solid, nothing is predictable. Professions disappear within two months. I'm talking also about my profession as a journalist, you know, now we, in the year of the social mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, networks, and et cetera. But I try, try, let, let's try to take our, uh, our conversation maybe to even to politics. Uh, do you think, will, will our era require a new kind of global leadership? 
with the character traits that we look for in our leaders in this age, different than uh, the ones we looked for until now, experience, responsibility, and so on. Will speed take the place of thought? Because I look at the president of the United States, uh, the leader of the free world, and let's <laughs> say he's 78. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, I, I've had the privilege working with President Paris of traveling with him um, in meeting 60 heads of states during the three years of, of the term where I had the privilege of working with him. And, and I think the, the style of leadership that emerged to me as the winner of the second decade of the 21st century, and I think this will take us into, you know, this decade as well, was what Angela Merkel brought forward. Um, we are talking in Israel, the country that um, uh, brought the emergence of Daniel Kahneman, Professor uh, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Laureate, and I'll borrow from him and you know, stand on his giant shoulders um, in his beautiful terminology calling, calling this you know, thinking fast and slow or leading fast and slow. And I think this is the major challenge of a global leader today. Uh, you have to move really fast on some areas. You have to be a great decision maker and move fast uh, on some areas of policy. Where on the others, um, you know, like science, pure R and D, elements related to social welfare and the the social safety net that you need to give people in order to not lose hope and not lose trust. There, you need to move really, really slow. And this is hard. These are contradicting traits. And I think what we've seen from call it 1990 to 2012, 2015 was the, the kind of instant leadership that really worked well with the Bill Clinton example of, you know, the, the pace of MTV. And subsequently, we've seen leaders, you know, grow on, on um, broadcast TV um, and being the face of the nation on a Friday night that doesn't work anymore. And I think the worst we can get, and we're seeing populist leadership uh, fail now after emerging and, and, and you know, ascending so fast between Orban and you know, Erdogan and others, they have gone too far. They went into managing and leading super fast without slow, without truth. So I think we need leadership that knows how to operate on both of those. I think Angela Merkel was a great example of that. Um, and, and there are now emerging leaders around the world that I think understand this better. Um, and so, yes, I, I agree with you. I think this era does require a new kind of global leadership. You just mentioned the late uh, President uh, Shimon Peres that uh, you've been working very close uh, with, and I knew as well. And I, I want to, you know, uh, let's let's leave our, uh, our our issue for a second and, and talk about him vis-a-vis -vis everything you just said, because he was in his 90s, and uh, also when he was in his 80s, he, he predicted so many things. He, he was talking to me about nanotechnology, I think mm -hmm. 15 years before it happened. I thought he's... Uh, I think I thought I thought he's insane. <laughs> and then he was talking about uh, no more governments controlling or leading or managing the world. This this world will be a world that is managed by huge and super companies like like Facebook and Google. And he said it 20 years ago, and everything happened. We mm -hmm. were mocking him, but uh, although he was yeah. you know a guy that was born somewhere in the beginning of the previous century. He saw it coming. So uh, what was his secret in your opinion? I think that that secret really relates to this combination of thinking fast and slow. I think, you know, while you move fast, you can't give up on the fundamentals. President Paris, uh, while he was able to move fast and be agile, had a very strong sense of where the fundamentals are. And I think that's, you know, what, something we can't give up on. And this is also for Israel going forward. We want to move fast. We want to be as fast as TikTok. We want to be as fast as Twitter also as we communicate as leaders. But there are fundamental areas like military strength, like infrastructure, um, like the strength of universities and basic science and basic research. Those are things you cannot give up on. And I think President Paris understood that even as we step into the 21st century, the fundamentals that make us who we are as humans are not going to move. They're not going to change. 
And I think that's a critical piece in the world view of, of a leader going into the you know, uh, third decade of the 21st century, understanding that the fundamentals are not going to change. They haven't changed, and most likely they will not. Female liberation and equality um, and female participation in the workforce is going to be critical. It's going to be crucial. Um, you know, productivity, total productivity in the workforce is going to be crucial. The strength of scientific institutions and trust in government, all those are not going to change. And so I think that's what he saw, you know, when, when he was talking about nanotech or, you know, stem cell research and others, he understood that these are fundamentals that are not going to change. Those who will master, uh, you know, material science at the nano level um, will most likely hold the keys to prosperity where it really matters in the 21st century. And, and I think he wasn't wrong. I think you know, when you look into, you know, where, how things unfolded um, over the last decade, more or less, you know, at least in my field that I had the privilege of working with him, which was this sort of diplomatic slash technological uh, combination and dimension, uh, he saw things ahead of, ahead of the curve through this combination of fundamentals that were moving slow and required attention. And, you know, the, the, the high pace of change um, that social media kind of, you know, enforced on all of us. I, I, I used to call him a, a high-tech dreamer because he, his dreams, most of them came true, were so unique. But, but I want to, to, to proceed. And uh, you, you mentioned that we are in an age, uh, we live in, a, in an era when, when the, uh, the conservative giants, the, the, the big firms and companies, uh, are more uh, vulnerable because a, a young startup with the, with the right idea Uh, can kill them within, kill uh, or, or you know, shut them up within uh, within uh, the two months. Let's talk about uh, the bad guys. Let's talk uh, talk about wars. Uh, do do everything that we just uh, mentioned can affect as well the modern wars. Will will it be more dangerous? Things will be. How, how will it will it look? Can you can you try to dream it for me? <laughs> yeah, look, I think, is it a dream or a nightmare, first of all, right? I yeah, think that's question course. number one that we're looking into. Um, well, I'm an optimist, and I actually think it's more a dream than it is a nightmare. And I think what happened with COVID also gives me good reason to, to adopt an optimistic worldview uh, with regards to the next decades. But let's, let's take it again fundamentally. Um, the law of accelerated returns, right? The fact that we had a decade where tech exploded and prices went down, If you look at it the other way around, you don't need that much money to create world-changing technology. And that affects both good and bad, right? So you know, if you think about um, the amount of money you needed to create a drone that could be GPS guided with a thermal uh, camera 12 or 15 years ago, uh, much like the battery on, 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 the, uh, on the electric car, would have cost you a thousand times what it costs you right now. And so a lot of the, the um, advantages that standing armies had 15 to 20 years ago uh, have been quashed, have been decimated. And we're seeing that, you know, I think we saw it with the rise and also with the fall of Daesh at the, at the time. The ability to, you know, produce, you know, HD over uh, uh, 3G or 4G internet from the ground and create a terror and create the effect that, You know, in previous, in previous times, only big armies could have, is a big deal. When you think about, you know, suicide drones that cost very little money, you know, it allows for a country like Iran under sanctions with literally no money to, to provide water for its citizens to put out there weapons that, you know, are uh, global grade top five in their ability to veto or create, you know, or create and cause terror. And so I think, you know, the next decade, we're going to see an unfolding of more and more of robotics and uh, drones and technologies, are also cyber, for, for that example, um, that are going to be deployed very accurately by either sub-state actors or not rich countries um, in a way that could create, you know, havoc and massive damage. My biggest fear um, towards the next decade or two is you know a dirty bomb 
or a biological warfare that would be created by a terrorist organization. Because when you think about the advancements in biotech over the last decade, again, that 42 days from mRNA for COVID to discovery and, and conclusion about a compound, which is now the Pfizer vaccine, what prevents a small group of very well-educated terrorists who distrust, remember, they don't need, need to be terrorists. It can be people who just distrust um, and have a, a disgruntled worldview um, in, in, in carrying out you know, that kind of, of attack. I think it's never been easier um, than this day and age. And we didn't speak about cyber yet. Uh, you see, I think now in Iran, you see yeah. almost daily cyber uh, offensives and attacks yeah. that no one knows where they are coming from. And you know, you could two guys sitting in the Ukraine can shut up uh, or yep. shut down a, a hospital in, in Tel Aviv. And it happened, by the way, in, uh, not in Tel Aviv, in, uh, yeah. in, in Hedera. So uh, it's also very dangerous. And, and like we just spoke about the, the conservative giants uh, that are so vulnerable, now I think it's the same with the superpowers. You don't need to be a superpower anymore. Yep. in order to, to cause a lot of damage, yep. and he just described it. But I, I cannot finish this conversation without going to Israel, the country that we both live in. Uh, do you think uh, Israel can continue to maintain its uh, qualitative high technology, technological edge in this fast-moving uh, environment? In other words, is Israel better suited and more adaptable to this age than other countries? Yeah, so I think first of all, maybe a quick comment on cyber. I think I think we're getting very close to um, the definition of when cyber is considered to be a kinetic attack um, in in a response of the of the uh, victim, right? So I think over the next couple of years, and I'm you know I hope it's not going to be in this Iran Israel context, but there's go- the, the time is coming very closely that a cyber attack is going to be interpreted as a kinetic attack, and the response will be kinetic and not cyber. Um, and I think we're, we're getting close to that, and a you know, small miscalculation can get us there. And, and so I think that's the next you know, iteration when it comes to cyber. We're now seeing you know, like two boxers punching each other uh, in 15 rounds um, through the cyber domain. I think at some point, we're going to see a punch of cyber being returned with a kinetic punch by a military and I don't think that's too far out so that's sort of you know my thought on on the next wave when it comes to cyber when it comes to Israel I am very very optimistic there's a saying I really love uh, by William Gibson a a science fiction author who said the future is here and it's just unevenly distributed and so when you think about it Israel's ideally positioned on the future distribution curve we really have everything we need to win and turn this decade into a golden decade and, and truly double our GDP. I mean, there's no reason why Switzerland will end this decade you know, north of a trillion, and we shouldn't. The, the, the strength of the workforce in Israel, the exposure to foreign direct investment is phenomenal. I mean, we've seen Israeli startups this year raise north of $15 billion. Ben, we are a 300,000 people community uh, of tech industry in Israel, not even 10% of the workforce in real terms. So when you divide at 15 billion to 300,000 people, I think we come out in top three of the world um, in terms of investment per capita in tech, which is completely private. So we Do you have, have an access explanation to that. For this, for have, this? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry to, to, well, to interrupt you because yeah, no, go ahead. A, an explanation to this phenomena that 300,000 people are producing the, those numbers you just mentioned in high tech, in cyber, in in biotech, in everything. Well, I think I think much like in the early days of Zionism, we are at an era of the avant garde, right? And Israel remains uh, the Israeli tech industry is very much avant garde in what we do. We don't, uh, you know, kind of improve. We don't start up companies that improve things by ten or twenty percent. Most of the startup leadership in Israel is avant-garde. The vision that comes out of Israeli startups over the, ne- of the last decade is not limited to, okay, let's start this company up, raise capital and sell it for two to 300 million um, and figure out what to do next. Um, 
companies like you know Wix or, or Fiverr or Memed or Immuni, and there are so many across biotech, across you know bioinformatics, across infrastructure. We are building the, if you will, some of the sewage of the next wave of the internet. And that might sound like very negative, but the infrastructure, those who control the infrastructure, the sewage, the railway, and that is cyber, that is software as a service companies, that is cyber. This is what we're doing. And, you know, if you think about the golden, you know, the gold rush, the 1840, 1849, right? Like San Francisco 49ers. Back in the day, those who discovered gold were really, really great. Those who discovered the mines, and I think those are American you know, VCs, those are still American entrepreneurs. But the big winners were Levi's and other companies who made you know, the equipment for the gold miners. And I think the, Israeli, the current Israeli tech industry is building the tooling for the gold miners of this modern day gold rush. And I love where we are in that context. And, you know, I don't know who's going to win uh, the next few decades. Um, you know, who's going to win much like the engine was for the UK or the diesel was for Germany? Is it quantum computing? Is it stem cell research? Is it CRISPR? Or, you know, other things in bioinformatics. But wherever you look on that map of, of those technologies that will determine the future, Israel is either in the top five or in the top 10. And when you combine that with our character and the access to capital and the maturity of the industry, I'm super optimistic. I think we have an incredible decade ahead of us. We have the right political leadership to take care of the thinking slow. That is infrastructure. That is global talent coming in. That is, you know, things like railway and, you know, the cost of living. I don't think anything can stop Israel uh, in, in really living up to its goals and really having a golden decade ahead of it. I think you're the next uh, Shimon Peres. You're very, very optimistic. <laughs> uh, by the way, we never mentioned the way that you're doing exactly the, the, what you just uh, described. Yeah, so, you know, as, as, uh, as, as the saying go, right, practice what you preach. Um, I think, you know, when, when Healthy IO, that's a company I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, to have founded seven years ago, with a group of incredible scientists and uh, tech leaders, is really turning the, the world of diagnostics on its head. We, with less than $100 million raised in seven years, are competing with giants like Roche and Siemens, LabCorp and Quest and, and, and others through turning the smartphone camera, the, the investment that Apple and Google and Samsung have put in the, you know, the selfie economics um, into a clinical grade medical device. And, you know, It's clear to me, much like the political leadership, as we discussed before, and leaders in this day and age, we need to have a very strong sense of, you know, uh, tolerance for failure or hedged failure environments in what we do. And so I'm, I'm very happy to have spent the last seven years outside of the diplomatic space, outside of the political domain, which, you know, had, had really formed my identity and learn how to form this. You know, hedged failure capability and align my tolerance at the company to grow really, really fast, but not be afraid to fail and make sure that where we fail, we, we, you know, we set it up in advance and we understand what we can learn from that. And I think that is a yet another critical you know, piece in how to lead um, in this coming decade, understanding that things are going to fail. And when they do, um, you don't try to you know, save them too much. You just think for the next thing that The next opportunity that emerges out of that failure and go, you, you go for that as fast as possible. It was fascinating, really. Uh, Yonatan Adiri, I Thanks for the opportunity. Very really. much. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll take now a short break and come back with some final thoughts right after it. Toda, Yonatan. Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much. Toda. Hello, I'm uh, Gilles Kepel, professor at uh, Sciences Po and uh, Normal Sup in Paris and author of a number of uh, books and articles on the Middle East. Through my new podcast, Reading the Middle East, on the award-winning media service and monitor, we will take a deep dive into the trends in the region with the authors and thought leaders who are shaping how we think about the Middle East. Reading the Middle East will be a fantastic addition to Al Monitor's outstanding podcast lineup, including 
including On the Middle East with Andrew Paraziliti and Amber Inzaman, and On Israel with Ben Kaspit. You can subscribe on your favorite listening platforms. We look forward to your joining our conversation. Thank you for staying with us. I think you will agree with me that this was an exceptional uh, conversation, something totally different and uh, highly interesting and fascinating. And I want to thank again uh, Jonathan Adiri. I know him for many years. He was uh, one of uh, late uh, President Perez's most uh, uh, gifted advisors for years. And uh, what I take, uh, among many, many other uh, uh, interesting things that he said, what I take from this conversation with Adiri is that, uh, I think he said it in the beginning, that uh, when I asked him, are we in, in, in an historical era like the, the, the Industrial Revolution, etc.? And he said that we are living in an incredible era, although it is not in the same scale or, uh, or magnitude of uh, inventions like electricity, light bulb, uh, or aviation. But uh, this era we are living in is an exceptional uh, uh, period of time in history. Uh, it's, it's a combination of two trends uh, that are, uh, have never happened at the same time. And he was talking about one is the uh, exponential growth of technology. And we have seen this before in times in history, but right now it is combined with a, a decline, very a fast exponential decline of price. And this brings us uh, to this very unusual era where uh, I, I call it the area of speed or pace, the, uh, the, the era of, uh, of uh, a huge... Uh, traditional dragons being slaughtered by, by very fast, new, and brave uh, innovations, etc. A, a very, I, I think this era, after this conversation, is uh, many, many opportunities, and it's also dangerous. Israel's place, uh, according to Jonathan Adiri, is almost safe in the in the top five or ten of uh, of the nations that will will uh, make an advantage of this era, and we have we all we all have to wait and see what comes next. Uh, I think it will come very fast as usual. We are used to it in the last ten or fifteen years. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you here uh, next week in the same place and the same time in On Israel in Al Monitor. I'm Ben Kaspi from Tel Aviv. Take care. Bye-bye.